Galatians chapter 5 and from verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Amen. May the Lord bless to us the reading of his own word. Our theme this evening is the Christian and the Ten Commandments. The Christian and the Ten Commandments. What should be the Christian's attitude toward the Ten Commandments? It used to be something largely unquestioned among Christians that while the Christian does not depend upon his personal obedience to the moral law of God for justification, but only on Christ's obedience to it and Christ's bearing the punishment of its transgression on the cross, yet nonetheless that law, as summed up in the Ten Commandments, defines the holiness which the Christian is to pursue and conformity to which is the effect of the work of the Holy Spirit sanctifying God's people in Christ Jesus. And uh, if we could ever have assumed that this was understood, we can certainly not afford to assume it today. There have been numerous ways in which this position has been under attack and uh, the rejection of the moral law as the definition of right and wrong for the Christian uh, is generally known as antinomianism that is anti against nomos law and this has taken on various forms Uh, in one way or another saying that the moral law of God summed up in the Ten Commandments is not the rule of the believer's conduct or at least not the conscious rule of his conduct. And uh, we believe that if this doctrine is taken on board, the antinomian view, it has serious repercussions for the cause of Christ. Our forefathers were clear on this subject. I'll just give you as a sample the Westminster Confession of Faith and its position. In chapter 19 of the Law of God it says this, God gave to Adam a law as a covenant of works by which he bound him and all his posterity to personal, entire, exact and perpetual obedience promised life upon the fulfilling and threatened death upon the breach of it and endued him with power and ability to keep it. This law after his fall continued to be a perfect rule of righteousness and as such was delivered by God upon Mount Sinai in Ten Commandments and written in two tables. The first four commandments containing our duty towards God and the other six our duty to man. Besides this law, commonly called moral, 
God was pleased to give to the people of Israel as a church under age ceremonial laws containing several typical ordinances partly of worship prefiguring Christ, his graces, actions, sufferings and benefits and partly holding forth divers instructions of moral duties all which ceremonial laws are now abrogated under the New Testament. To them also as a body politic he gave sundry judicial laws which expired together with the state of that people not obliging any other now further than the general equity thereof may require. The moral law doth forever bind all as well justified persons as others to the obedience thereof and that not only in regard of the matter contained in it but also in respect of the authority of God the creator who gave it. Neither doth Christ in the gospel any way dissolve but much strengthen this obligation. Although true believers be not under the law as a covenant of works to be thereby justified or condemned yet is it of great use to them as well as to others in that as a rule of life informing them of the will of God and their duty it directs and binds them to walk accordingly discovering also the sinful pollutions of their nature, hearts and lives <coughs> so as examining themselves thereby they may come to further conviction of humiliation for and hatred against sin together with a clearer sight of the need they have of Christ and the perfection of his obedience. It is likewise of use to the regenerate to restrain their corruptions in that it forbids sin and the threatenings of it serve to show what even their sins deserve and what afflictions in this life they may expect for them although free from the curse thereof threatened in the law. The promises of it in like manner show them God's approbation of obedience and what blessings they may expect upon the performance thereof although not as due to them by the law as a covenant of works so as a man's doing good and refraining from evil because the law encourages to the one and deterreth from the other is no evidence of his being under the law and not under grace. Neither are the forementioned uses of the law contrary to the grace of the gospel but do sweetly comply with it the spirit of Christ subduing and enabling the will of man to do that freely and cheerfully which the will of God revealed in the law requireth to be done. Now that's a long quotation but it's an excellent summary of what we may call the reformed position on the moral law of God. Now let us consider. Firstly, the Christian's sanctification causes him to conform to the law of God in thought, word and deed. The Christian's sanctification causes him to conform to the law of God in thought, word and deed. Insofar as the Christian is sanctified, to that degree he will conform to the moral law of God. By the moral law we mean the same as in the Westminster Confession which distinguishes uh, between the ceremonial law of the Old Testament which was done away with in Christ being typical and pointing to Christ who was to come and the, what we might call the civil law, the penalties given to Israel as a body politic. The moral law summed up in the Ten Commandments are those duties which are permanent. And in so far as the Christian is sanctified, made holy by the Spirit through union with Christ, to that degree he will conform to the law of God. We can consider this under several headings. First of all, love to God and obedience to commandment are entirely compatible. Love to God and obedience to commandment are entirely compatible. In the Garden of Eden, Adam was without sin. He therefore loved God with all his heart prior to the fall. 
there, yet there were creation ordinances appointed by God that became embedded in the Ten Commandments. Marriage, the family, the weekly Sabbath, these were all appointed as creation ordinances. But also there was a positive revelation from God, by that we mean that which could not be known without God actually telling it in words, uh, a positive revelation giving a prohibition with a threat attached. You have that in Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Now this shows us that there is nothing unspiritual about the observance of even negative concrete command and that sinless love to God was entirely compatible with such observance. Adam, before the fall, loved God. One way in which that love to God expressed itself was in the observance of this negative commandment concerning the tree of good and evil. We may also say, secondly, under this heading, the created order embedded in the Ten Commandments is not obliterated by sin and grace. The created order or the requirements of it embedded in the Ten Commandments is not obliterated by the facts of sin and grace. The creation ordinances of marriage, procreation, labour and Sabbath are embedded in the 4th, 5th, 7th commandments. And in the New Testament, the created order is frequently appealed to as determining what Christians should do. So 1 Corinthians 11, verse 8 and 9, For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Power in the sense of a covering, a sign of authority. So that the uh, woman is to wear a covering on her head in congregational worship in order to reflect by that sign her acceptance of the created order. Likewise, the man is to have his head uncovered as a sign of acceptance of the created order. And so the facts of the fall and redemptive grace do not obliterate the created order and the creation ordinances. They actually, the, the, the grace of God enables the people of God to heartily acknowledge that created order and the uncovering of the man's head and the covering of the woman's head in congregational worship is a sign of acquiescence in that created order. In 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 12 to 14, the Apostle says, But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Now here, the created order is again appealed to as uh, indicating what the church's practice should be that the teaching should be in the hands of men not women because this reflects the created order which saving grace causes the people of God to acknowledge and accept. 
<coughs> so the overall principle is clear. Redeeming grace in the Old and the New Testaments causes men and women to heartily embrace the created order and that created order is embodied in the moral law, the Ten Commandments. Thirdly, under this heading, love and law coincide rather than contradict. Love and law coincide rather than contradict. Love to God and man is commanded in the law of God. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. Love is commanded. Now that's a statement of the obvious and yet it needs to be stated because there is a tendency in Christian circles to somehow think that law and love are opposites and they aren't. The law of God commands men to love God. It commands men to love their neighbour. In uh, Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 16 Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among thy people, neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbour, I am the Lord. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart, thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbour, and not suffer sin upon him. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. I am the Lord. And then in verse 33, and if a stranger sojourn with thee in your land, ye shall not vex him. But the stranger that dwelleth with you shall be unto you as one born among you. And thou shalt love him as thyself, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So God's law commands love to God and love to man. So love and law are not opposites. The law commands us to love. Then we may also say the specific commandments indicate the concrete expression of love. The specific commandments indicate the concrete expression of love. Romans 13 and verse 7 to verse 10. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honour to whom honour. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbour, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. So true love to our neighbour, as the law commands and as the apostle tells us, shows itself in the keeping of the commands of God from the heart as they bear upon our neighbour. We are not competent to define what is and what is not loving. That needs to be emphasised. We are not competent to define what is and what is not loving. God tells us how to love The idea that law and love are opposites or even alternatives is to be utterly rejected. The law commands us to love, the law shows us how to express love to God and man. Then fourthly on this point, 
conformity to Christ and conformity to the law are the same. Conformity to Christ and conformity to the law are the same. Our Lord Jesus Christ fulfilled all righteousness. He was made under the law. To do thy will I take delight. O thou my God that art, yea, that most holy law of thine I have within my heart. That's the metrical version of Psalm 40, verse 8. To suggest then that obedience to God's law from the heart is not spiritual is an attack upon the Redeemer because that's what he did. He kept the law of God perfectly from the heart and therefore if we are united to Christ to the extent that our union with Christ effects sanctification within us we will do the same. And in connection with the Sabbath Christ never defended his actions with respect to himself and the disciples by arguing that the Sabbath was cancelled. Whenever Christ was attacked for his or his disciples' practice concerning the Sabbath, he always demonstrated that his practice was consistent with the Old Testament scriptures. He never uh, answered the Pharisees by saying that the Sabbath is cancelled. He only ever answered by showing that they had mis misused and distorted the fourth commandment and that his practice and that which he required of his disciples was the true observance of that commandment. So in Mark chapter 2, Mark chapter 2 and verse 24 And the Pharisees said unto him, Behold, why do they on the Sabbath day that which is un not lawful? And he said unto them, Have ye never read what David did when he had need and was unhungered, he and they that were with him? How he went into the house of God in the days of Abiathar the high priest, and did eat the showbread, which is not lawful to eat, but, the, but for the priests, and gave also to them which were with him. And he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Now here our Lord Jesus Christ defends his disciples' practice, not by saying the fourth commandment doesn't apply, but by showing from the Old Testament, we needn't go into the exact nature of the argument, but showing that their practice was consistent with Old Testament teaching. He uses the Old Testament scriptures to defend the disciples' Sabbath keeping. And the Lord Jesus is defending the true understanding of the fourth commandment, not advocating its cancellation. When he says the Sabbath was made for man, he is saying it was made for man as such, not for the Jews, not only for the Old Testament, but man as such and as a blessing. And if the Sabbath is a blessing, then the Redeemer's coming did not deprive us of it. But then Christ's teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, as it is called, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 18 and 19. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass one jot or one tittle, shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and to shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Note the contrast in verse 27. 
Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. The contrast is not between Old Testament teaching and his teaching, (coughs) but between the ancient rabbinical interpretation of the commandment and the true meaning which he now declares. That's why he says, it was said by them of old time. Now that's not referring to scripture. It's referring to the interpretation of the scribes or of the rabbis of old. And uh, our Lord Jesus, quoting scripture, constantly says, it is written, it is written. And when he seems to quote the commandment in verse 27, what he is saying is that the rabbis of old took that commandment and said, the bare words, the external act, is all that it refers to. This becomes clear in verse 43. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbour and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, and so on. Now what we have in verse 43 is clearly a rabbinical distortion because this is no quotation from uh, the Old Testament. So likewise, in all the other places, when Christ says, it has been said, or it was said by them of old time, he's saying, this is the rabbinical view of this command, but I say unto you, do this. And so verse 44 is simply giving and elaborating the true Old Testament teaching. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. This isn't something over against Old Testament teaching. The Old Testament taught it. Exodus chapter 23, Exodus 23 and verse 4 and 5. If thou meet thine enemy's ox or his ass going astray, thou shalt surely bring it back to him again. If thou see the ass of him that hateth thee, lying under his burden, and wouldest forbear to help him, thou shalt surely help with him. So the idea of loving our enemies was there in the Old Testament. So Christ here in Matthew 5 is not saying, The Old Testament taught this, but I'm teaching you something different. What he's saying is, the rabbis construed the Old Testament as meaning this, but what it actually means is this. That is the contrast throughout. So conformity to Christ's life and example will mean conformity to the Ten Commandments from the heart as they bear upon thought, word and deed, as the expression of our love to the Saviour. Then fifthly, God's standards no more change than God himself. God's standards no more change than God himself. The moral law is the outshining of God's holy character as it bears upon human conduct in this present world. The changes in the form of worship from the Old Testament ceremonial to the New Testament form have to do with the progress of God's redemptive plan. The Old Testament ceremonies pointed to Christ coming to accomplish redemption, whereas the new, in the New Testament the Redeemer has come and redemption has been actually accomplished on the cross. The form of worship has changed with the advance of God's redemptive purpose. But the Ten Commandments are fixed and were written by the finger of God on the tables of stone. The form of worship changed from the old into the new, but the moral law and the second commandment as the rule of worship remains. You see, the form of worship 
can only be known by verbal revelation from God whereas even the ungodly without verbal revelation revelation in words have some knowledge of the law of God so Romans chapter 2 and verse 13 for when the je- of verse 14 for when the Gentiles which have not the law uh, do by nature the things contained in the law these having not the law are a law unto themselves which show the work of the law written in their hearts their conscience also bearing witness that their thoughts and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another there we are being told that even the unregenerate man has a conscience and a certain measure of awareness of right and wrong though he has not the slightest ounce of love to God in him there is an awareness of certain things being wrong and uh, in that sense he is a law or the law unto himself he as his constitution is being made in the image of God with a conscience is the medium by which God's law comes to him and the law defines what sin is 1 John chapter 3 verse 3 and every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure and what does that purifying consist of whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law for sin is the transgression of the law and ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins and in him is no sin whosoever abideth in him sinneth not whosoever sinneth hath not seen him neither known him little children let no man deceive you he that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous he that committeth sin is of the devil for the devil sinneth from the beginning for this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin for his seed remaineth in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God now throughout that passage the word sin and righteousness is used and what is meant by sin and righteousness is given to us in verse 4 for sin is the transgression of the law so the Christian who longs for the purity of heaven will be found purifying himself on earth and in union with Christ that entails the mortification of sin as defined as transgression of the law are Christians to avoid sinning well the answer is obvious if Christians are to avoid sinning then Christians are to show their love to the Saviour by keeping the moral law. Then sixthly, the sanctifying spirit causes conformity to the law. The sanctifying spirit causes conformity to the law. Romans chapter 8 tells us there is therefore now no condemnation to them that which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit now the apostle has been dealing with the doctrine of justification by faith in Jesus Christ and the imputation of Christ's righteousness and his atonement uh, his atoning death to the child of God but then in chapter 7 he has raised the question that's justification but will I ever be delivered from the corruption of sin in chapter 8 he is returning to the theme of justification to show that justification deliverance from the guilt of sin must bring with it sanctification because our 
first uh, guilt in Adam, in his first transgression, brought the judgment of God. And part of God's judgment was that we were consigned over to corruption. Therefore, Christ's atoning death on behalf of his people, bearing the guilt of sin, also means there can be the reversal of that consignment to the bondage and tyranny of sin. In other words, Christ's death secures the justification and the ultimate sanctification of the people of God. So in verse 3, what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Christ's bearing of the guilt of sin purchases for God's elect the blessing of justification and the blessing of sanctification. All the blessings of salvation are purchased by Christ. The bearing of the guilt of sin means that the blessing of sanctification can be bestowed upon God's people. The bondage to sin can be broken and reversed and will be for the elect of God. And this blessing of deliverance from the tyranny of sin which begins at the new birth which progresses throughout the Christian life and is completed only when we enter heaven is defined in verse 4 that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit the law could not make us holy because of our fallen nature, the flesh. However much we know what we should do, we do not and cannot do it because of our sinful nature. But God sending his Son to bear the guilt of sin paves the way not only for justification, deliverance from the guilt of sin, but for sanctification, deliverance from the power of sin. And that deliverance by the Spirit of God working in us, that sanctification is defined as the righteousness of the law being fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. So the blessing of sanctification, of being made holy, purchased by Christ, bestowed by means of the new birth, the continuing work of the Spirit throughout our days, completed in heaven, is defined here in terms of fulfilling the righteousness of the law. So walking after the Spirit is not a mysterious, mystical business. It isn't airy-fairy. It is the Spirit of God enabling the Christian through faith in Christ Jesus to keep from the heart, in thought, word and action, the concrete commandments of the moral law of God. Then seventhly, the law was given to the church of God. In Exodus chapter 20 and verses 1 and 2, Exodus chapter 20, and verse 1 and 2, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. This moral law was given to the church of God, the professing church of God in the Old Testament. You see that it is Jehovah, the Lord in capitals, in our King James Version, indicating that the word is Jehovah, the covenant God. This name is constantly linked with God as the covenant God. And he says, I am the Lord thy God. He addresses his covenant people, the people of God, the covenant people in Christ Jesus, even though Christ had not yet come. The language of the covenant, 
thy God, my people, declares that bond which God establishes with sinners in Christ. So when God said to Abraham, I will be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee, he wasn't talking about something other than the covenant of grace in Christ. The covenant that God makes with sinners in every age since the fall of Adam is the covenant of grace in Christ. That's why Psalm 95, for example, is applied in the book of Hebrews to the professing church of God in the New Testament. For he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today if you will hear his voice. Ezekiel 36 and verse 25. Ezekiel 36 and verse 25. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. And from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments, and do them. And ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. Now, what is described there is the new birth. And as a, as a result of the new birth, which Nicodemus the master in Israel should have known if he'd known the Old Testament, that new birth would result in God being their God and they would be his people. John 20 and verse 17 takes up the same language in the New Testament. John 20 verse 17, the risen Saviour, Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascend to my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. There the Lord Jesus is telling them that his Father, his God, is the God and Father of those who are in him. They are heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Second Corinthians chapter 6 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14 Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness and what communion hath light with darkness and what concord hath Christ with Belial or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel and what agreement hath the temple of God with idols for ye are the temple of the living God as God has said I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people now there the Old Testament language I will be their God they shall be my people is simply carried over to the New Testament church of God Revelation chapter 21 and verse 3 and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying behold the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God verse 7 he that overcometh shall inherit all things and I will be his God and he shall be my son there the covenant bond reaches its final perfection God was the God of Israel only in terms of the covenant of grace in Christ Jesus any other concept of God's relationship with Israel is dispensationalist error and dishonors the Lord Jesus, the only saviour of sinners and the one through whom alone God is the God of sinners. Israel at Sinai was called the church in the wilderness by Stephen in Acts 7 verse 38. He calls Israel in the wilderness, the church in the wilderness. So the moral law, the Ten Commandments, was given to the Old Testament church of God. Though it is of universal obligation, it was given to the church of God. 
First of all, a corrupt church, a mixed church in its outward form, but the church of God nonetheless. And it was for the people of God then, and the one great lawgiver has not repealed it, and therefore it is for the church of God now. But then eighthly, the Christian is under law to Christ. The Christian is under law to Christ. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 21 To them that are without law as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. What does the apostle mean by under law to Christ? The context is the apostle's declared willingness to give up his legitimate freedoms, legitimate in themselves, in the interests of seeking the spiritual welfare of others. He's not adding to God's law. Love to our neighbour demands it. Even legitimate things should be used legitimately. And the use of legitimate things in a manner harmful to others is illegitimate. And in illustration, what did that mean? It meant, firstly, he did not try to keep the law to be accepted with God. He tried that as a Pharisee and he had abandoned it and uh, counted all such things but done for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. The man who tries to earn acceptance with God by personal obedience to God's law is not a Christian. Secondly, he knew that Christ fulfilled the types of the ceremonial law and that these were no longer binding or required of him in themselves. But thirdly, he was under law in the sense that he was obliged to show his love to the Saviour by hearty obedience to the permanent moral precepts of the Lord. Because the Gospel does not make void the law, yea, it establishes the law. Romans 3.31 the atonement honours the law of God in its nature. It is because God's law is so utterly fixed that Christ died bearing the transgressions of that law on behalf of his people. And the effects of the, on the beneficiaries of Christ's death is that they keep that law. Secondly, the second main thing, the Christian is to consciously regard the law of God. The Christian is to consciously regard the law of God. There is a view that runs something like this. Yes, the Christian will keep the law, but not as a conscious duty but as a spontaneous outworking of fellowship with Christ. That is, he will, so to speak, keep the law, but without thinking about that law. This view is contained, for example, in Edgar Andrews' commentary on Galatians, Free in Christ. And uh, he says, Their actions and attitudes are dictated by the Spirit within rather than by external rules. And of course, these actions and attitudes must be validated by Scripture. Now, what do we say to that? The law is spiritual. The law is spiritual. It is of the Holy Spirit. Paul validates what the fruit of the Spirit is by the law in Galatians 5, 14 and 23. And the law was never, ever a mere set of external rules. It was never that. It bears upon external conduct, but it never only bore on external conduct. 
Paul says the law is spiritual and the commandment is holy and just and good. So that we should never uh, run down the law of God as an unspiritual thing. Now, Andrews also says, Paul's proposition is not that believers do the law, but that the re righteous requirement of the law is fulfilled in us. The, the distinction is important. Then he quotes another writer and says, Paul never speaks of the law's fulfillment in prescribing Christian conduct, but only while describing its results. We shall see in a moment that this is completely untrue. It is a mixture of precious truth and error. It is true that knowing the law on its own will not lead to holiness. Knowing what we should do on its own will never make us holy. Indeed, our sinful natures are such that we react in the opposite way. Sin by the commandment, taking occasion by the commandment, becomes exceeding sinful, like a stagnant pond when you prod it, the stench comes up, or like the supermarket trolley with the, uh, the, those ones that you can't, you push them one way, they go the other. That's what we're like by nature. It is also true that it is only by the grace of God and through fellowship with Christ that we obey God's law. Having view of Christ will we hate sin. Only as we look upon him who was pierced will we mourn for sin. But we are to consciously think of what God commands of us. We are to consciously determine what the law of God requires in order that we should know the correct channels in which our love to the Saviour must flow. Consider this. Repentance must include loving that law which formerly we hated. Repentance is turning around from sin to Christ. If the carnal mind is enmity against God and is not subject to the law of God, in other words, loving sin, loving transgression of the law, then the repentant sinner who trusts in the Saviour because his heart has been changed by the Spirit must say, oh how I love thy law. You can't trust Christ without starting to love that law which formerly you detested. The Christian is represented as delighting in the law of God in Romans 7.22 For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. That's talking about the regenerate man. The unregenerate man does not hate sin. When the apostle says earlier in verse 15 of that chapter, the good that I would I do not, the evil that I would not, that I do. Uh, and uh, that he does that which he hates when he sins. He's describing the regenerate man. The unregenerate man does not hate sin. When he sins he doesn't do what he hates, he does what he loves. He might feel bad about it, he might feel uncomfortable about it, he might feel guilty about it, but he doesn't hate sin as sin. Whereas in verse 15 the apostle is saying that when he sins, he does that which he hates. So it's talking about the Christian. And the unregenerate man's ego is to the fore in sin, but Paul's is not. He says that when, that when he sinned it is no more I that do it but sin that dwelleth in me by which he means that he, in principle he has a nature that is opposed to sin the qualification in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing distinguishes him from the unregenerate in whom sin has undisputed dominion that's in verse 18 so it's talking about the Christian man. It's talking about those who serve the law with their mind, verse 25. Their mind is 
toward the law of God as opposed to the flesh, the remains of indwelling sin with which they serve the law of sin. And so verse 22 is describing what is not at all true of the non-Christian but what is true of the Christian. I delight in the law of God after the inward man and in the innermost being. You can't delight in something that you ignore and take no notice of and never think about it. When the apostle says, I delight in the law of God, that means he did think about the law of God. And the law is appealed to by the New Testament writers. We've seen Romans 13, verse 8 to 10. The apostle is not confused for confirming what parts of the law still apply he's appealing to the law as confirming what he says because the moral law is regarded as standing in Ephesians 6 1 to 3 reference is made to the fifth commandment children obey your parents in the Lord for this is right, honour thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. He appeals to the commandment, uh, or the fifth commandment, telling these children to obey their parents in the Lord. That's a gospel motive, out of love to the Lord. Show your love, obey your parents. The same is found in James chapter 2 verse 9 to 12 Galatians 5 verse 13 to 14 at the most basic level the Bible tells us not to sin so we must keep the law of God every command to mortify sin means mortifying that which is the transgression of the law then thirdly how is the Christian to use the law? We'll just be brief. How is the Christian to use the law? Firstly, to bring to a knowledge, to bring the knowledge of sin. By the law is the knowledge of sin. But just as confession of sin and repentance don't stop at conversion, so also neither does this function of the law. We need to be shown our sins all through our Christian lives. How do we know of something sinful? By the law of God. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Matthew 6.12 Confession of sin is part of the continuing, is a continuing feature of the Christian life. How can there be confession of sin if we don't define sin as transgression of the law? You cannot confess sin unless you pin down your sins by the law of God. Looking in the mirror of God's law, we see our filthiness. We confess our sins knowing that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. We are to use God's law to define the sins that must be mortified. We must know our enemy. When the apostle says, mortify the deeds of your members, he's not talking about something that cannot be defined or pinned down. Colossians 3 verse 5, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence and covetousness which is idolatry for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience in the which he also walked some time when he lived in them you'll notice here that the sins the apostle mentions are both those sins which bring God's judicial wrath upon the ungodly and also those sins which are to be the target of the believer's mortification. 
He's saying these same things that you are to mortify bring the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. So there isn't two different standards. There's one law that defines the basis of the unbeliever's condemnation and defines those sins which the believer is to mortify. The standard of the believer's sanctification and the standard of the unbeliever's condemnation are the same. And so the law defines the channel of the believer's devotion to the Redeemer. The idea that we can be so spiritual that we don't need specific commandments is foolishness. Men have done all sorts of things out of professed love to God. We don't know how to show love to God. We need to be told. And the law of God shows us if you are redeemed by Christ and you love the Lord, this is how you must live. And it ought to be used to increase our sense of gratitude to the Redeemer. It is this law we transgressed so wickedly and so many times. It is this law Christ perfectly kept, fulfilling all righteousness. It is the curse of this law that he bore, being hanged on a tree, and gratitude to him will incline us to keep this law. It also is to be used to define the duty of civil powers uh, in uh, rule. Not every sin is crime, but the law of God is the proper starting point, but we leave that for just now. Well, application, very briefly. Firstly, whenever someone asks for New Testament proof for anything, you need to wake up. There's something wrong. The moment a professing Christian says, what proof have you in the New Testament? We are not to ignore 80% of the Word of God. And the Old Testament is 80% of the word of God we're interested in biblical proof the whole Bible the Old Testament all of it is the infallible word of God any requirement in the Old Testament not cancelled by the coming of Christ still stands uncancelled Old Testament command has every bit as much force as New Testament command God does not have to repeat himself in the New Testament for anything to be binding upon us. If he said it in the Old Testament and he hasn't cancelled it, it stands. It's impudence to tell God that he has to say it in the New Testament again. If it's there in the Word, in the Old Testament, and Christ's coming does not take it away, then it stands. Secondly, prize the weekly Sabbath. In the New Testament, with the resurrection of Christ, the day has changed the first day of the week. It has the distinctive name, the Lord's Day. Prize the Lord's Day. It's a blessing and not a burden to those who love the Lord Jesus Christ. In a hostile society, it may bring many difficulties but the Sabbath should be a delight. Isaiah 58, verse 13, and I defy anyone to find anything more spiritual than this. Isaiah 58, 13, If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honourable, and shalt honour him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the inheritance of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. But what about the law of God? 
in heaven. This law, summed up in the Ten Commandments, what about the lad law in heaven? If it is the outshining of God's holy character, what will happen to it in heaven? There is no more sequence of days in heaven. There is no night there. There is no marriage in heaven. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but as, or as the angels of God in heaven. There is no childbearing in heaven. But what about this law? Well, the essence of the law applied to the life of man on earth in the Ten Commandments will be beautifully fulfilled in heaven. In heaven only God will be worshipped. God will be worshipped perfectly according to his own will. That is his will of commandment. His will is done in heaven. His name will never be irreverenced or blasphemed in heaven. Even in thought. There is a perfect love to God among unfallen angels and redeemed men and women. There is perfection of both service and rest. His servants shall serve him. And they rest from their labours. The two will exist together in heaven. Not a sequence of days, six labour and then one Sabbath rest. But the principle of service and of rest will be there. There will be no rebellion in heaven. The principle of the fifth commandment will be observed perfectly. There will be no malice, the essence of the sixth commandment. All human relations will be ordered in perfect love and according to the mind of God, the essence of the seventh and eighth commandments. There will be no falsehood, the essence of the ninth commandment. There will be no envy or covetousness condemned in the tenth commandment. In heaven everything will perfectly conform to God's holiness. There will be perfect contentment in, in, in all the inhabitants of heaven and love to God to the full extent of our capacity and love one for another will be found there. For we will love all that God loves in heaven. Nothing that defileth shall in any wise enter therein. All our longings for Christ and conformity to him and to his law will be fulfilled. We know not what we shall be, we know, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Whoso hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. And we purify ourselves by seeking his grace through faith in Christ Jesus to mortify sin, which is the transgression of the Lord.